Good evening, everyone. I'd like, a, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's virtual author event presented in collaboration with Miami Book Fair, Lit Hub, and Culture Crusaders. Thank you for joining us and thank you for supporting a locally owned book, independent bookstore in Books and Books. Tonight, we are beyond thrilled to be able to host uh, two really of our very own local authors, um, Chantal Acevedo and celebrate the publication of her latest novel, Muse Squad, The Cassandra Curse, which is her debut middle grade and an action-packed fantasy novel about a Cuban-American girl who discovers she's one of the nine muses of Greek mythology. It's been called perfect for fans of The Serpent Secret, the Aru Shaw series, and the Percy Jackson and the Olympian series. Chantal Acevedo was born in Miami to Cuban parents. She is the acclaimed author of adult novel, adult, uh, Sorry, adult novels, including The Distant Marvels, which was a finalist for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. She is also a professor of English at the University of Miami, where she directs the MFA program. Chantal lives here in Miami with her personal muse squad, aka her family. Uh, our conversant tonight is Alex Segura, an acclaimed writer of novels, comic books, and podcasts. He's the author of the upcoming Star Wars, Star, Star Wars Poe Dameron Freefall novel, the Pete Fernandez mystery series, and a number of comic books, most notably the superhero noir, The Black Ghost, the YA music series, The Archies, and the Archie Meets collection of crossovers featuring real life cameos from the Ramones, B-52s, and more. He's also the co-creator co and co-writer of the Lethal Lit Crime YA podcast from iHeartRadio, which was named one of the best podcasts of 2015 by the New York Times. By day, he is co-president of Archie Comics, a Miami native. He now lives in New York with his wife and children. So a couple of reminders before we begin. On the green button below me, you can quickly and easily pick up your copy of Muse Squad tonight, which will be signed by Chantal. We will also be accepting questions for the Q&A portion. Um, it's in the bottom right, right hand corner. It says, ask a question. So go ahead and click that, leave a question for Chantal. And now that those are covered, I will hand this over to Chantal and Alex so that we can get started. Hello. Hi. Hey, we're live. Hey, thanks so much for having us. We are here. Yes, thank you oh, so much for right. being here, Alex. Oh, thanks for inviting me. This is awesome. I feel like I'm back at Books and Books and back home. Um, first of all, thank you for asking me to interview you about this book, which I love. And it felt so personal and so fun. Um, so I really want to just ask you about how you got to this idea. I know you, you've written so many different books and different kinds of books. And, and what, what about the Muse Squad jumped out at you and said, this has to be my next thing? Oh, thank you for asking that question. And thank you for agreeing to be um, here with me tonight. It's really exciting. Yeah, so, so glad I've gotten to know you over the past year. And so, yeah, you're representing Miami here. And, thank, yeah, and thanks to Books and Books and, and the Miami Book Fair, which, you know, represent the soul of the city, really. But, um, yeah, so Muse Squad, I've got, got it here in case anyone hasn't yeah. seen it yet. My Muse is with the Miami skyline. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the question about where the idea came from. You're right, for me, um, I'm not a debut author. I've written many adults for books for adults, but um, in terms of the kidlet world, I definitely am like mm -hmm. new to this. Um, the idea came from, um, well, let me back up a little bit. I've been wanting to write for a, a kid's book for, for a while. I was just kind of waiting for the right idea to come to me, but also um, it's a little bit nerve wracking when you switch genres, right? When you jump genres, it is a little bit nerve wracking and intimidating. So all of that was holding me back a bit. Um, but I, I felt like I was something I really wanted to do, especially because my kids were sort of in that middle grade age range, right? Mm. Um, they start, they bookend, you know, the, the, right. the that, that range. And so we were actually in London on a family vacation and we were at the Victoria and Albert Museum, which is featured in the book. And I was waiting for, you know, one of my kids to, you know, use the facilities. And there's this beautiful, <laughs> you know, this is what you do as a, as a mom. Yeah. And there's this beautiful staircase with uh, two muses, um, busts of muses sort of flanking the staircase. And I was taking pictures of them and reading the little placard about them and sort of the idea popped into my head. What if, how cool would it have been if the muses had been children, right? Because they are these forces of inspiration, but kids are amazing at that, right? They think so outside of the box. They like, there's just no boundaries in their imagination, right? I thought muses probably were kids, right? They should have been kids. Yeah. And I, 
had that idea and thought, you know, and then took out my phone and wrote it down in notes. So yeah, yeah. It got home after that vacation and started writing. So it was pretty cool because you, you rarely know the exact date. Right. You know, where you were, when that idea came, you know, like sort of being able to capture it is very cool. And it's it's interesting when you get those ideas, sometimes they almost feel like too good to be true. Like surely somebody else has thought of this or like how did, how am I getting this like on a silver platter? But that's how it yeah. works usually. Um, and it must be amazing to have, you know, you have two kids and they probably served as really big inspirations for the work itself. So were you kind of seeing parenting as research too for the book as you were writing it or? I think in many ways for writers, I think, I mean, all lived experience for writers becomes yeah. sort of the, the fuel, you know, because you, you, you have to be perceptive to the world and to the way people in, engage with one another. But certainly when you're thinking about I'm writing an 11 year old and what does that look like and what, what are those decision, what's that decision making look like for an 11 year old right. in an 11 year old's headspace? Um, definitely. I was sort of, you know, looking at him a little bit more <laughs> closely. <laughs> <laughs> Jotting it down, just, just being creepy, just being creepy, mm -hmm. um, and, and not just my kids, but you know, my my cousins all had little girls around the same age, and and my goddaughters too around the same age. So I was, I just was really lucky in that our family is just very child rich, you know, in in the moment, and so yeah. just getting to spend all that time with them and, and observing them was helpful, for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I just want to remind our attendees that you can pick up a copy of the book. Just push that giant green button um under my giant head and <laughs> you can ask questions and i'll do my best to get to them once we get to the q a portion but um i want to zoom out a little bit and just kind of do the elevator pitch you know how would you describe yeah. Muse squad to someone that you know just to put you on the spot now because it's i don't have to be on the spot for this yeah. um like how would you describe Muse squad to somebody that has no idea what this book is about so here is, I'm, I'm not good at elevator pitches. I just depend on editors to come up with them and then I just steal right. their work, right? And so, and, and my agent too, right? And so, you know, the way they've been talking about it, which is helpful, and I think it's the way it's also on the jacket of the book and some of the promotional materials is a girl, um, imagine a girl who one day accidentally turns her best friend into a pop star. Right. And so that's sort of like the opening. That's how the book opens. But she accidentally turns her best friend into a pop star. Um, she's mm -hmm. one of the nine Greek muses. She discovers she's one of the nine Greek muses, right, of classical myth after this magical thing happens with her mm -hmm. um, best friend. And she joins the muse squad. Of course, there's nine of them. Four of them happen to be 11 year old girls. And so um, they, they form this little tight group and are tasked with with saving the world and inspiring people who are meant to do great things. Um, so they become heroes, but of a different kind, of a different sort, right? They're not battling heroes so much as um, forces of inspiration. And uh, I, I imagine you were a fan of mythology and different kinds mm -hmm. of lore independently, but did you find that you had to do a lot of research just to make sure you were buttoned up and how you were describing things? Or was it fun? Like for me, research is usually whatever I'm obsessing over. If I'm thinking of cults, I'll write a book about cults. You know, it's not, yeah. you know, it's, it's it's not it doesn't feel like homework. So how did how did it work for you? Oh yeah, absolutely. And sort of my adult books are all historical fiction, and so research is my right. thing, right? Like yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's the thing that someone has to get the shepherd's hook and like pull me away from, right? Because I will just do too much of it. Um, yeah. But with the muses, I I mean, I didn't have to do you know all that much, right? Because it's sort of um, the muses are a pretty well known mythology. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know all of their names and, you know, like and exactly what they all represented. And so that kind of stuff, you know, right. took a little bit of work and then tooling their names so that they're, you know, more contemporary um, mm -hmm. as well. It was just, it was that kind of research, but it was also set in Miami, which was so fun right. to do because this is my hometown and it's where I grew up and it's, it's some of the locations, some of the big sets you know, of the book are, are, are just here, you know? And so that it was kind of liberating to not have to do that research because usually I, I'm just neck deep in research for my books. And so it was, it was kind of nice yeah. to have to do so much. No, I love that part just in reading it. And uh, I think we both kind of came to our books on similar paths, you know, wanting to see ourselves in the stories we write mm -hmm. because maybe we hadn't seen them in stories we read as, as kids or as adults. Um, so a big part of what I liked about the book was just seeing areas that I remember from being at home or being in Miami. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the spots that people will see in the book or? Yeah, I think, you know, the without trick spoiling is, anything. without yeah, spoiling yeah. anything, you know, always the trick when you're writing something that's local is to not, um, um, 
shut out folks who aren't from Miami, right? Who will feel like, well, that's, that's, I don't get it, right? Um, so there's always a balance you have to strike, but Miami readers will, will recognize Santa's Enchanted Forest, renamed. Um, ugh, Santa's. <laughs> and I, I don't know if we're going to get to keep Santa's. I think it's up in the air. It might be going away. Um, oh, readers yeah. will, yeah, readers will recognize the Sequarium, too. It's a pretty big scene in the Sequarium mm -hmm. as well. Um, I modeled the school after my daughter's school. And um, she she um, was both, she loved that and was both a little bit horrified, right? She didn't want her friends to recognize themselves or their teachers, but I, I promised her I didn't write her friends into the book or her teachers, you know? Um, that definitely but yeah. it reminds, us, it reminds us of our age. Now we're the ones that are embarrassing our kids. That's right, <laughs> so, that's right. But you know what, I wrote a cafetorium scene. Um, <laughs> and because Miami schools have cafetoriums, you don't, you have a yes, cafeteria, yes. which is also your auditorium. Um, I've mentioned that up here in New York and I just get like blank stares like what right is like yeah. what is a cafetorium like what's well, this Frank <laughs> this Frankenstein situation in our schools <laughs> right. yeah. yeah so it was fun um well I, I want to hear a little bit you know I think we're, we're we're on similar boats in that we kind of deal with our day jobs we have these you know pretty busy writing careers we have families what's what's your key to i guess finding some kind of balance is there balance i don't think there is but maybe you have it and i don't oh gosh you know and yeah because i know you have young kids too yeah um the yeah balance is hard to achieve and especially you know the last four months very yeah. hard to achieve right very hard to achieve um yeah i think like i think for me it's not so much about balance but about efficiency you know mm -hmm. so like in the summers when the girls you know were once you know they were going to just day camp i had a couple of hours right and it was about being as efficient as possible during those right. hours you know I, I think muse squad was written because largely because the girl scouts had a camp here that my kids would go to yeah. you know what i mean so yay girl yeah. scouts <laughs> um yeah, so, I, I find it's mostly maximizing the time you yeah, do get yeah 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 yeah, uh, yeah that's it so it's, it's never really about balance it's like for me because everything nothing is, is balanced right and, and some moments in your life are completely unbalanced, right? Where you're giving all of it to your family or a lot of it to your day job, right? Your work. I, I teach at the University of Miami. This is my office here. Yeah. Um, I'm here today because my Wi-Fi at home is out. Oh no. I know. So like I'm- <laughs> Nothing's even, easy. It's never easy, yeah. I mean, I'm even supposed to be here today, but <laughs> but it's it's fine. We're safe. Came in with a mask. Um, yeah, we won't tell. Yeah, no, and campus is super empty. But yeah, like again, it's, it's not. Um, it's it's about doing doing the best you can with the time that you're given. Really, I don't know if that's how is it for you. No, it's it's similar. As yeah. I I hear my daughter screaming in the background. It's uh you know you just manage what little, you know I feel like there's this idea that you have to write a certain amount of words a day to be considered a writer, and I actually kind yeah. of hate that idea. I, I think so. if you're thinking about your book and you're putting in the time when you have the time. Because I think otherwise, people who maybe have jobs or are marginalized and don't have the same benefits that a lot of people have will immediately be turned off on the idea of writing. Like, well, I can't write a thousand words a day, so I'm not a writer. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's just those little pockets of time. If I have 10 minutes, you know, when the kids are asleep or if I have an hour because I have a lunch break or something, it's just maximizing those minutes and, mm -hmm. and eventually you have a book. Um, mm -hmm. So. How, how was this experience writing? I want to talk about the protagonist in a little bit, but I want to I want to also contrast it to your earlier novels. What were some of the challenges or differences you found writing middle grade versus an adult novel? Did you find yourself kind of pumping the brakes with certain moments, or was it freeing, or or just how different was it? You know, it was. It is. It's a different experience for sure, right? It's. I learned after my second book that I should plan books, right? Like, so the, for the first two, I was like, I'm a pantser. Like, have you ever heard the pantsers versus yeah, plotter? Yeah, 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 yeah. Pantsers versus plotters. Yeah. Plotter. That second book, A Falling Star, nearly killed me. And because I, and I painted myself into 20 different corners. You know what I mean? I just didn't know what the, I knew the ending, but I just didn't know it clearly enough. Um, right. and, and so it was super hard. And every book since I've tried to think it through, right? Even before beginning. And I think with a book like Muse Squad, a book that's for middle grade writer, uh, readers, the action is so important that you can, I think you can very easily sort of see how, you can sort of reverse engineer that ending a little bit right. quicker. 
then you might with like a big sprawling historical novel with many adult leads, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I could, I could see the ending, you know, a little bit more clearly earlier. Um, so that felt um, quicker for me. Huh. But there were challenges too, right? Because every, everything that you read or everything that you write comes with its own sort of learning curve, right? And so, of course, my first time writing middle grade, sort of the, the steep part of that curve for me there was um, about slowing down the points of decision making, right? Huh. Because like a, a, in an adult novel, an adult character will decide something, right? And then through gesture or whatever, the reader will pick up on why they're making that decision, right? I was approaching it that way. And then my really brilliant editor, Kristen Renz, was like, she kept she's so gentle and her notes were always like i don't know if she's watching but her notes were always like um can we get a little bit more of her thinking here like what what does, what does yeah. callie think here what's in you Callie's? have to be gentle people should be gentle with yes I, I, you know, need that gentle touch. Yeah. I know we startle easily <laughs> yeah, exactly. but um yeah. but yeah and what and i realized is that you it's first person it's a kid you have to slow down the way she's making these decisions, right? Yeah. Because th those decisions that for an adult would be like, yeah, quick, I'm just doing this because life has taught me that that's the answer. For an 11 year old, they're mm -hmm. facing it for the first time. So the decision making becomes like everything slows down there. So you'd mentioned pumping yeah. the brakes and while the, while the story feels rapid, right? Those are the moments, those interior moments slow down quite a bit for me in ways that mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, if, if all of your training and all of your classes you've ever taken have been writing for adults, you're told the opposite. You're told yeah. show, show don't tell, right? Like that subtlety is um, mm -hmm. sort of what, what the goal is. And here it's not, not that it's unsubtle, but that it's, it's slowing it down a little bit because your reader is 11. Right. And these yeah. are, these are first time problems for them, you know? So I, yeah, I always, I mean, I've I can I can totally identify with that. Just having you know jumping from adult crime novels to like YA, like mm -hmm. but the Poe Dameron books YA. Uh, so you have to kind of inject those pauses, those pauses of mm -hmm. understanding and you know initial experiences and yeah. a little bit of like emo angst. You know you have to add that weight, that rawness of emotion. And and I could you know mm -hmm. the book Mu Squad moves so quickly, but you're right. There are these moments of of introspection that feel really natural and genuine. So that was, I thought that worked out really well. Um, you talked about Callie a little bit. I want I want to hear more about her and kind of have you paint a picture of who she is just so we mm -hmm. can be introduced to her because this is the first of two, right? The first of two, it's a duology. Right. Yeah. So Callie is a Cuban American girl. She lives mm -hmm. here in Miami. She's 11 years old. Her parents are newly divorced. Um, she has two big brothers who are twins. They're 15 years old and they are, she says, annoying as allergies. Um, but she loves them a lot, right? They're protective big brothers. And she's got a best friend who's kind of like a little bit of a popular girl um, who becomes way more popular when magic gets involved. And she, she, she's got a big heart. Um, and she, she's grieving her aunt, who, a beloved aunt who, who recently passed away as well, her tia Annie, who becomes a major figure in the story. And so she's a kid with who has a lot going on, right? She's juggling a lot of different things in her life. But at the same time, she's still sort of, she's trucking along, you know, like she's not, um, she's not like sinking in sort of the depths of despair, right? To quote Anne of, you know, yeah. Green Gables, right? Like she's, she's, um, <laughs> she's, she's just moving through her life, right? And there's a lot of joy and, and fun in her life, even though all of these things are happening. Um, and then this this amazing magical thing happens to her, right? She's also kind of a she's not precocious, right? I didn't want to write a, a precocious again Anna Green Gables kind of character. She's she's not. Right. She's she's very average, and and in, in terms of like school, like she's average school. She's you know she's um, there's no like one big passion that she's like I'm a you know scientist or I'm a, a you know I gym, gymnast or whatever. Like she's just like a regular kid, right? And but I love that. I love that yeah. she was kind of, no, I don't, you know, regular, even that has kind of a negative connotation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, she hasn't figured out what she wants to be yet. And exactly. I love that. that it's, like, because I, I was the same kind of kid, like, I wasn't sure what I wanted to be yet. Yeah. And maybe you were the same too. Same. And, and to be kind of plucked and given this great opportunity. It's, yeah. It felt yeah. more genuine. Yeah. 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 So she doesn't, she doesn't know. And even into book two, she doesn't know. And, and, right. and, it, and it, for me, that was, that was a, a bit of a, 
that was a really important character note for myself um, because it one it gives her sort of room to start discovering what are these passions, what are these things that she's good at, what are, what what makes her unique and special, right? But I think also it's something that, and I've seen my own kids echo it, like what's my thing? Like, I don't have a thing. And especially yeah. when you have friends who have a thing, you know, like you have the friend who can draw or the friend who, you know, is good at sports or the one who's a good right. singer. And you're like, well, what's, what's my thing? You know, you just sort of feel very middle of the pack in, in school and you're not winning the awards and, and that kind of thing. And I, and I wanted a book for, for that kid, you know, because yeah. I feel like so many books are about those sort of kids at the, the, the other side of that spectrum, right? Who are yeah. just very the unique. Kid who gets yeah. Something special on top of that. Yeah. Yeah. They're all just very, very, very unique, you know. And um, I know, like we sometimes talk about, like the the manic pixie dream girl, kind of. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that kind yeah, of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so special, <laughs> but. Um, or even even yeah. like superheroes, like Peter Parker's already like a science whiz when he yeah. becomes Spider Man. Like he's already like a special kid. He's already. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but that's interesting. It's an interesting mm -hmm. idea. Um, so how much how much of the character you know every 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 character we write has a piece of us, I think, even from the villains to the supporting mm -hmm. cast. So when you were writing Callie, like what what connected with you personally? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's a lot of what we've been talking about, right? Sort of feeling, yeah, yeah. feeling a little middle of the pack, you know, is, is part of it. Um, I mentioned this with, um, in another interview I did with um, a mm -hmm. book blogger named uh, Paola Guerrero. And we talked a little bit about, um, we talked about that relationship with her best friend you know, and, and growing up, I had mm -hmm. like one of those superstar best, best friends. You know what I mean? Like, she was yeah. like it. She was it. You know what I mean? Like in, in the school, <laughs> star, she, was, yeah. she was it. Yeah. And and being sort of her sidekick and how you're usually okay with it. And then there are days when you're just you're just not okay with it anymore. But it's, yeah. it's not even your friend's fault. It's that's you. <laughs> you know, and that's your yeah. own that's your own sort of growth that needs to happen. Um, and so I think in, in that respect, sort of in that relationship with her best friend, it's all a lot of myself too, but she's also sort of this pastiche of, you know, all these kids in my family. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I get that. I can relate to that a lot. Um, I'm glad you said you were a plotter because I became a plotter most definitely with, with this last, with the Poe Dameron book, just, just because it became so much work to just kind of craft, even knowing the ending or even knowing what was going to happen, it becomes, become such a chore to throw pages out and have those horror stories and having this limited time. Mm -hmm. um, we talked a little bit about jumping from genre to genre from adult to middle grade. Did you have, were you a reader already? I mean, obviously with kids, you probably had to read a lot with them, but did you find yourself doing a lot of middle grade research for lack of a better term to kind of get the tone right or to feel comfortable writing in that space? Yeah, absolutely. But also I had been a long, a long time reader of right. um, kids that I taught high school for nine years as well. So, Mm -hmm. I was always sort of reading YA and reading, you know, an interesting middle grade. Oh, I taught, well, my first teaching gig was at um, Coral Park here in Miami. Oh, wow. I taught Coral Park. I taught at, at HML, which was my alma mater. So, hey, HML. I did that <laughs> yeah. uh, for a year. And then we moved. So I taught for three years in a prep school in Pittsburgh and then three years again in a prep school in Connecticut. Um, I love these lost chapters. <laughs> yeah, I had all these like we're always doing the whole academic jumping around, yeah. you know, and so yeah. Um, and so yeah, I had all the all those different kinds of teaching experiences. So I'd been reading. There's some HML fans in the chat. Oh, are there? Yeah, <laughs> go charge. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we yeah yeah. So I'd been reading kids' books for a long time and enjoying them too. Um, yeah, I like to read in different modes. You know what I mean? I like mm -hmm. in the same yeah. way I like to listen to music in different modes. And 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 also, especially when it's something that's brand new to me, you know, if, if people are really into something, I wanna know why. Like why are they into this? Yeah. You know, and, and maybe it, it won't speak to me. Like, you know, and, and like horror doesn't speak to me. Um, though yeah. I've tried, you know. Um, but maybe it won't maybe it won't, but I've given it a go, you know. So I, I've never felt like writers should be all like, I will only read this this one thing, you right. know. Yeah. Um, for sure. Uh, and so did you map out both books? Did you know, like starting out, this is going to be a two book series, you wanted it to have a sequel or was it something yeah. where you finished the first book and you realized there was more to say? No, we pitched it like that. I pitched it as a, uh -huh. as a, as a potential two or more. Um, and Harper Collins, Walzer and Bray bought it as two. 
And so then I got to really just in, in earnest think about it as a, a, an arc that completes after you know two books. Uh, with the second book, which revisions, I've got revisions due at the end of the month. Um, I had a whole plot no planned pressure. out. No pressure. I had a whole plot planned out and I started writing it. And then sometime in like October of last year, I realized it wasn't the story I wanted to tell and I scrapped it. I read something that Madeline, um, Madeline Miller, who wrote Circe and all those great um, yeah. retellings. Uh, I, I won't say it because it'll, it'll be a spoiler, but she, she blogged about a particular uh, Greek myth and like, you know, the top of your head goes like that. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, yeah. I gotta restart this book, right? Like I just, I have a new idea and it's better. And so I had yeah. to start, start all over. But that's so, kind of experience, yeah. like that we've done, we've both been doing this kind of long enough to know it's gonna suck at first and you're gonna have to start over, but mm -hmm. it'll be so much more worth it when you're done. Yeah. And you actually have that better idea on paper. Mm -hmm. um, are you working on any other stuff or? Um, working on playing with another middle grade idea at the moment uh -huh. um, and just seeing where that, where that goes, like playing with the voice. It's a fun awesome. idea. Yeah. And um, all right, so I wanna remind everyone that you can buy the book uh, just by clicking on this giant green button and ask some, I'm gonna ask some of the user questions now that we have, we have a four or five in there. Yeah, that's the book. Yeah, it's Did I miss anything? Did I like forget a, a key plot point or anything? No. Do you wanna say something about your book that's coming up? Uh, sure, yeah, this is your party. I don't wanna like. But wait, wait, <laughs> I wait, I, I feel the force. Hold on, I'm gonna yes. use the force. I'm using the force. Are you ready? You oh, ready? wow. So wow. tell us. That is impressive. Yes. You, so, you do uh, want to tell us. You do want to tell us. Want. These are the books you were looking for. <laughs> um, yeah, in a few weeks, uh, my first Star Wars novel is coming out. It's um, a Poe Dameron YA novel, Poe Dameron Freefall. So did you, you watch the new movie, right? So if you yeah. watch the movie and you're wondering, you know, what was he doing with the Spice Runners? Who is Zori Bliss? Like, what is Poe's origin story? That's the whole book is is basically his coming of age and leaving his home world and becoming uh, the Poe that we love, that we saw in Force Awakens and uh, Last Jedi. So that was crazy. Yeah, that was fun to write. And uh, yeah. it's definitely how I learned how to be a plotter over a panther. <laughs> because I you bet. have to get all that stuff, you know, signed off like before you right. put pen to paper. And, and uh, in the writing of that, I was like, yeah, this is much better than just kind of flying crazy, you know, without even thinking about what the next scene's gonna be. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Um, I love it. Yeah, let I'm me excited. know what you think. I hope you like it. Yeah, I'm super excited. You get to tell the space Bobby story. Like, <laughs> you get to tell it. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I think excited. people. I hope people will will come at it with an open mind and enjoy it. And you know, because a lot of the characters can be contentious. You know, everyone has opinions mm -hmm. about what they want mm -hmm. to do. So mm -hmm. that's um, gonna be great. And we have an idea that we're talking about sometime. Uh, I know you love graphic novels and I work in graphic mm -hmm. novels and do graphic novels. So maybe we'll get a chance to tell it at some point if there are any, any publishers out there who want a Cuban American superhero story. <laughs> That's right. We've got some good Let ideas, me, uh, don't we, Alex? We do, we do, we do. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Let me see some of these questions. Okay, Christina asks, what is the best book you've read this year? Hmm. What is the best book I read this year? I've been reading a lot. I've been like binging a lot of books. Oh, I've really? Just, I've had a yeah. lot of trouble with fiction. Yeah. Recently, though, like I, it took me in the be the beginning of quarantine. I was um super stuck. Like I just couldn't get past the page. I think everyone's we're all our brains were just yeah. mud. You know what I mean? Right. It, we were mm -hmm. super stressful. And then I started I started to pick up books and and things moved a lot faster. Um, but and of course right now. Of course, I'm 100% blanking on the books that I have loved and I've read, <laughs> which is what always happens. Um, I can I can answer one. Yeah, I go. How you think? Yeah. Um, one of my favorite crime novels of the year is These Women by Ivy Pachoda, mm -hmm. and it's it basically flips the script on the serial killer idea. Instead of like following the cop chasing the serial killer, it's about the victims, and you really don't even hear about the serial killer. It's much more about the women and their experiences, and it felt so she's a great writer her prose is like magnificent and uh it just felt like such a smart flip flipping of the script and mm. even that once the novelty of that wears off you're still like so gripped by the language so i thought it was 
magnificent. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm remembering now. The book that yeah, cracked, yeah. The, the book that cracked it open was The Poet X by Elizabeth Acevedo, which I had, I bought it when it first came out, and it was one of those like on my TBR pile, and everyone loves it, and it's so great, and it's a novel in verse. And I finally opened it, yeah. thinking, well, maybe a novel in verse is what I need, you know, to get, you know, reading again. And it was, and it's, and it was so beautiful. Such a, it's such a beautiful book, and I think everyone should read it. Um, and I read, um, I just finished Ninth House um, by Lee Bardugo, and it's terrifying. Oh, yeah. And I just said, reason I don't like horror, but I think this may be the one that maybe will push me, you know, to reading yeah. a little bit more of it. It's, it's legit scary, but it's set in Yale, and we, my husband and I, we lived in New Haven. Um, oh, okay. And uh, so it was cool seeing all those places giving, being given this really creepy, creepier than normal, because Yale's pretty creepy, but creepier than yeah. normal. <laughs> Uh, yeah, extra treat, creepy, yeah. Extra creepy treatment. Yeah. yeah. No, that that was that was really good. That was a really good. One. Uh, speaking of book suggestions, Patricia Engel wants to know what are some of your favorite middle grade or YA books of all time. Oh my goodness, Patricia Engel. <laughs> we could talk about her <laughs> books for a long time yeah, exactly. too. Everyone, go go look at Patty's books. She's amazing. Yeah. Um, you know who is um. um just terrific, Kate DiCamillo. I mean, I, I think as a middle grade writer, Kate DiCamillo, she's she's just tops. You know, everything she writes yeah. is is so moving, is so moving. You know, and, and so beautiful. Um, there are a lot of middle grade writers. So yeah, for she'd be she'd be right up there for me. Um, everyone's really excited about Uncle Rick, or the Rick Riordan books, right? Because they're coming to Disney yeah. Plus. You know, they're getting another chance. So those are those were I think a really good series, um, obviously. And there's some books I'm super excited about that are coming out. Um, Adriana Cuevas is a fellow Juanita, um, The Total Eclipse oh, yeah. of Mr. Lopez. That's coming out in a couple of weeks. Super excited about that one. That's also a beautiful middle grade story too. We need to start like a Cuban American uh, writer group chat or something. Oh my God, that would be fun. <laughs> a retreat, a uh, virtual retreat. Yeah, exactly, a podcast yeah. event. Um, Books and Books says, how, how, do you, how do you bring the Greek mythology motif into the modern age? This is from Chauncey Maid. Hey, Chauncey. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was, I think what's nice about those stories is that they, the reason they hold up is because they're easily, you know, brought into the modern age, right? They're, they're sort of human questions, like just very, very human questions, you know? This yeah. idea, and with the muses specifically, I think that the biggest, sort of the, you'll see the muses in this book and also the sirens in the book too. And I, and I saw sirens as a kind of, um, almost the opposite of muses, right? Whereas the muses inspire the sirens tempt, you know? And they mm. tempt, you, tempt you to no good, right? Like, they, you know, like right. the muses push you to good, the sirens are, are, are pulling you towards what's not good. Yeah, the muses cheer you on. But yeah, and the sirens are like, hey, yeah. come here, I got something for you, you know? <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's, it's, it's not what you want. Um, and so, but those are just, those are just universal ideas, right? The universal ideas. Yeah. And, and so to be able to play with Greek myths is, is, is wonderful. I think it's the reason why we still talk about these stories today. Yeah. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you kind of talked about it a little bit with that answer, but someone, Jesus, Amy, Calliope, and Iris ask, why did you write about the muses? So what was it that drew you as a writer as opposed to just who the muses are? Yeah. I added that part. But. Yeah, of course. You know, um, I think it's sort of at the top of our conversation. We talked about yeah. being at that museum, being at the VNA, and, and sort of getting that idea. Um, I think I was also just open to the idea after sort of wandering around this beautiful place, you know, this, this inspired you know, place where it's, it's, it's one example of inspiration after another, right? Whether it's sculpture or design or, or whatever, you know, in this place. And so that idea of inspiration um, was, I think, the most compelling part of it for me, right? Like, like, like where does inspiration come from? You know, like where, yeah. where, do, where do these ideas, where did that particular, you know, idea come from? And, and how did those synapses fire in that particular way, you know? Um, yeah, I find that the, I mean, my, the most inspiring moments are when you're not even thinking about it, when you're just kind of open to it. I found like, you know, like taking a walk or doing something mundane or mm -hmm. like you said, waiting for your kid to finish using the bathroom. You're just like looking around and suddenly these things click together. Yes. The harder you look for an idea, the worse, the more it escapes you, right? Yeah. So true. Yeah. Um, 
Cassie Gwilliam said, what problems arise from adding magic to real life without making everything seem too unrealistic? That's a good question. Mm. Yeah, because magic could be a, um, that's too easy. You know what I mean? Or was that too convenient? Yeah. That's another thing that my editor likes to write on the margins. Is this too convenient? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but gently and with like a smiley face, right? Yeah. Um, is this too convenient? And it's something that you have to constantly check yourself with, right? right? Like like is it because that's that's the danger of writing magic into any. Is story. it just that you kind of had to set the rules up early so that way when yeah. you're doing the story you don't break them and you've kind of got this sandbox built or? Yeah, you have to sort of think about okay, what are the parameters, right? Of, of of the magic the magical use in this world and there and there have to be limits right and so I mean and, and you know right from comic books like once a, a superhero has too many powers like you no longer can write anything for them because they're right. too they're too powerful right but then it becomes very thinky like it becomes like silver surfer or something right like he's just like thinking right. all the time or, or, or whatever because the, the powers are too are too too grand so you have to yeah, it's like a super, superman syndrome like he just can yes. do everything and he can't really be hurt so it's not as exciting. So we need kryptonite, yeah. right? Like, like we need like the, yeah. the thing that's going to trip him up, and so and that's a limit. That's his limit, and so or and he has other like emotional limits as well, right? And mm -hmm. and so it's it's setting those up. Otherwise, yeah, then it's 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 also easy. You know what I mean? It it yeah. There's no yeah fun no. In that. It, yeah. I'm trying to find that I have it. There was one more question that I think I lost. Mm -hmm. uh, give me one second. Okay. Did any of your children or godchildren inspire anything from this book, from JP and V? Okay, did any of them? Yeah, I mean, lots. I'm trying to think if there's a very specific, very specific one, you know. Um, I'm kind of drawing a blank as to like a specific okay. thing that they yeah. may have, they may have inspired. They're at the present, yeah. But they're kind of all over, they're kind of all over yeah. it. They're kind of all over it, really. And, um, but certain things are, are very personal. For example, like we in our family lost someone very close to us and her name was Annie. And so she was like really important. Like she was just a really important member of our family, you know, and, and someone who the girls, you know, miss and my goddaughters miss tremendously. And so centering her in the story and making her a kind of wise guide, you know, was mm -hmm. was was for me a tribute, you know, a tribute to those to those girls and, and to their, their aunt. Um and so that's that's deeply personal, you know, like for me. Like, yeah. That's deeply personal, but um, but yeah, like characteristics, I'm kind of blanking on on some of them, but they're just they're just okay. They're all over it, you know. Like they're yeah. all over it for sure. Sometimes we don't even think about it because we're just yeah. drawing from our experiences, and they just mm -hmm. end up on the page. Um, mm -hmm. So my final question, and I, I've saved it for the end because I I was thinking about it throughout the book as I read it. Um, you know, what's what's the takeaway that you want? You know, you write it. You write it. It's a middle grade book, but it's also written like anyone anyone can enjoy it and anyone can experience it and take something out of it. Um, but as you finish the book, what what did you want people to get from it? What's the not the message? I hate the message. Like you're not mm -hmm. preaching to anyone. But what's the takeaway you want people to pull from from you, Squad? Um, one of them. I think there's probably a couple of things. You yeah. know, I, I hope that kids who are reading get from it, right? And one of them is that they're sort of to redefine their notion of heroism, right? And it doesn't have to be big flashy, the, the big flashy hero, you know what I mean? Sometimes you can be a hero to someone else for like, it's just a really simple gesture or a really small thing, you know? And, and I think we all have those people in our lives who had had one conversation with us that was that changed the course of our lives, you know? And that that was a, 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 a an act of heroism, right? Whether they whether they knew it or not, because it was it took bravery to say it or it took a, a kind of courage, you know, to take that step. Right. Um, that to be a helper is heroic too, right? You know, Mr. Rogers, yeah. look for the helpers, you know, like, like quoting Mr. Rogers, but I think that's such a powerful exactly. thing, you know, and, and the muses are helpers at, at the end of the day, they're, they're mainly helpers, you know, and so that, that, that being there for your friends, um, is important, but also that there's a kind of a heroism within you, right? And that maybe it's a, it's a quiet kind, um, and, but it's also valuable, right? So maybe you're not that like superstar, you know, kid in your school, but but there's a hero inside too. Yeah, I, I definitely, I think that's perfect. Um, we've gotten, I'm, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but we've gotten a few questions asking if you're going to read a little bit from the book. Oh my goodness. I mean, I can. If you want to, but I, I don't want to, I don't want these, I don't want the uh, people asking, including 
your friend and mine, Lynn Barrett, to feel like I'm ignoring them. <laughs> oh, is it Lynn? She also yeah. asked whether I, I kept that lightsaber in my office. And the, yes. Don't we all, Lynn? <laughs> don't you? Don't you have one? No, uh, you don't have to. But. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll just, maybe I'll just read the, maybe just the opening, right? Yeah. Just the little, the opening. That's always fun. Yeah. And this, and this is called, the chapter one is called The Problem with Heights. And People this are cheering is, you on in the chat. So. Yay! So this <laughs> is, here's one thing that, that you all don't know is I didn't actually use the force to get that lightsaber. My, one of my bestest and oldest friends is, is here with me. And, um, <laughs> and so she inspired this opening chapter, right? Um, and she loves uh, Jordan Knight from the New Kids in the Block. And so the first word in the book is Jordan because Callie and her, and her best friend um, are at a, at a concert. They're at a concert together. And then um, later they get on the Metro Rail and something scary happens, but we won't get that far. So, the Metro yeah, so you'll get some <laughs> Callie and you'll get her best friend. And then her father calls with some news. So this is how the, the book opens, right? And you remember her parents are divorced. Jordan! I shouted so loudly it felt like I'd swallowed the steel wool my mom uses to scrub the sink. Beside me, my best friend, Raquel Falcón, was red as a stop sign and screaming her head off too. We couldn't help ourselves. There, on stage and in the flesh, was superstar singer Jordan Miguel, and he had just pointed straight at us and blown us each a kiss. Raquel and I had won front row tickets on Y100's Guess That Sound contest. We called in and guessed the noise correctly. Restaurant chopsticks breaking apart. Now we were at the concert and Jordan Miguel had made actual eye contact with us. Raki, I squealed, clinging to my best friend's arm. I know, she shouted back, her eyes locked onto Jordan Miguel as he danced up and down the stage. He sang all his hits and we knew every word. By the time the arena lights finally came back on, we'd lost our voices. Then we went to go spend all our money on concert t-shirts. My phone rang while we were in line for the shirts. I dug it out of my pocket. It's probably my mom, I said to Raquel before looking down. I must have made a face at the screen because Raquel's eyes widened. I mouthed the words, my dad, to Raquel, and she nodded. Hello, I answered the call. Callie, mi niña, how was the concert? Fun, I said. Papi lives in New York City with my stepmother, Laura. Guess what, Papi asked. It was hard to hear him over the people shouting their souvenir orders. I thrust my money into Raquel's hands and she bought our t-shirts while I talked with my dad. Guess what, he asked again. Chicken butt, I said, rhyming with him like I always did. Bobby laughed. You're going to have a baby brother or sister soon, he announced, the way the DJ said, you've just won tickets to the Jordan Miguel concert, except it wasn't anything like that. Oh, I replied. I curled my fingers tighter and tighter around my cell phone as he talked. Are you happy, Callie? Aren't you happy? Bobby asked me. I didn't know if I was happy or not. I already had brothers, older twin brothers to be specific, and they were as annoying as allergies. Why did Bobby have to call now anyway on the best night of my life? I shouldn't have been surprised. His timing was always bad. Bobby married Laura a year ago, and six months after the wedding, they moved over a thousand miles away. We hadn't seen him since he left. When he lived with us, Bobby was always tired. I'd like to think that he wasn't tired of us, but that's not the reason he left. Add a new baby to the equation, and well, if the universe ever invented a better way to tire out a grown-up, I don't know what it is. I try not to think about that at all. I'm happy, Bobby, I said. You okay? He asked. You sound funny. I lost my voice at the concert, I said quickly. Ah, I remember those days. Well, big sister, we'll talk soon. Laura sends her love. Love you, Bobby. Love you, kiddo, he said. Just as I ended the call, Raquel appeared with t-shirts in hand, holding them up like trophies. Jordan Miguel, she said for the billionth time that night. Yay. Thank you. I wish we had the crowd, uh, the sound of the crowd, but I, I like to pretend that everyone is clapping in front of the computers. <laughs> yes, that was I great, that so. was great. I love annoying and allergies. That's so, such a great line. Mm. Um, well, this was a treat. I don't have any more questions. I think we covered so much great stuff and I'm so excited mm -hmm. for you to launch this book. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me uh, grill you about News Squad. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for reading, Alex, and for being here today. You made it really yeah. special. For yeah. sure, yeah. When 
it's it's funny, uh, you know, just seeing seeing the Miami in your work, it, it, it just makes me happy that so many there's so many authors like us kind of doing this, you know, represent mm. not rep I guess representing, yeah, that is what I'm saying. Like just showing where we're from and showing our roots and and uh, blending this great culture with, with our mm. work. So it was it's really mm. an honor. I I'm, I felt really lucky getting to read it early. So Yeah, Thanks oh again. thank you. Yeah, we should thank pick everyone up the book. Too. you can still buy it. Yeah, thank yes. you so much for coming. Thanks to Books and Books and uh, Miami Book Fair and uh, Lit Hub and everybody. Yeah, thank you, Chantal and Alex. Thank you for being thank with you. us tonight. That was a thank great you all conversation. For being here. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks to everyone for, who joined us tonight. Uh, we have a lot more virtual events coming up this month, so please check us out on social media and sign up for our email blast so you won't miss out. Uh, don't forget to pick up your copy. That green button below me is still working, or you can search on our site at any time and you'll get a signed copy from Chantal. If you're local, you can also uh, pick it up curbside. So good night, everyone. Stay safe. Bye.